Hi everybody. Welcome to Ordinary Differential Equations, the mathematical framework and tools for understanding, modeling, and predicting anything that moves. Hi, welcome back. In this lecture, I want to talk about the ideas of chaos. When chaos became popular in the 70s and 80s, it captured a lot of people's imagination. And I want to talk about this concept in the context of the ideas that we developed in this course. It's not possible to go very far, but it is possible to raise the issues. All right, I've provided you with a number of popular, but technically very accurate uh, references at, at the beginning of this, and so I encourage you to look at them. But the phrase chaotic behavior calls to mind some sort of randomness and unpredictability. However, keep in mind we're studying deterministic differential equations, and we have an existence and uniqueness theorem. If the initial condition is specified precisely, the evolution, both in forward and in backward time, is specified precisely. There isn't any randomness or unpredictability. The key is, the, is specifying the initial condition precisely. Chaotic systems have this intrinsic property that they can magnify any imprecision in initial conditions in such a way that the outcome over a given period of time looks unpredictable from what it would have been if you had 100% accurate initial conditions, which in practice you never do. So I want to talk about what are the key features. Often it's said that um, chaotic systems exhibit sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And I want to talk about what that is and how that could give rise to this type of behavior. So let's set, let's, um, let's establish a setting. We're talk about autonomous vector fields and Rn, uh, existent in uniqueness, so Cr, R greater than or equal to 1. These could be, chaos occurs in much more generality. It occurs for non-autonomous systems, for discrete time systems, for infinite dimensional systems, or partial differential equations. We're just going to talk about the basic setting that we dealt with in the course. The flow generated by this vector field will be our usual terminology. And we're going to let lambda denote an invariant set for the flow. And we're going to talk about whether or not the dynamics is chaotic on an invariant set. Now, I haven't said anything about the nature of this invariant set. Is it closed? Is it open? Is it bounded? Is it unbounded? Important point very important point, we'll come back to it. So we have a definition of sensitive dependence on initial conditions for this flow, and basically it just says that the flow is said to have sensitive dependence on initial conditions on an invariant set if we can find an epsilon greater than zero. So it, this is the measure of separation. So that for any point x in the invariant set, we can find a neighborhood of that point, x, and there's another point in that neighborhood so that those two points separate by the amount epsilon as the flow evolved. That may not seem such, that seems a little clumsy. I, I always felt that way when I first learned it. Don't worry too much about that. We can, if we have the flow precisely, which in practice you almost never do, but in these examples we will, we can verify this property. And so I'm going to give you four examples, and we're going to explore these issues where the core property is sensitive depends on initial conditions that we're going to start with. Okay, example 45, the classic saddle point in the plane, autonomous saddle point. x dot equals lambda x, mu dot equals minus mu y, lambda and mu are positive. So the x-axis is the unstable manifold of the origin. The origin is the hyperbolic fixed point. 
and the y-axis is the stable manifold of the origin. And we, we can compute the flow exactly. All right, we need to identify an invariant set. There's lots of invariant sets, you recall. So the simplest invariant set would be the fixed point at the origin. Not interesting, that's not chaotic, it just sits there. Okay, then we have the stable manifold, the y-axis, where you take any two points on the y-axis, that's an invariant set, and they just move, evolve towards the origin and they get closer and closer together. No sensitive dependence on initial conditions, but take any two points on the unstable manifold, the x-axis, and let them evolve in time, and because of this factor, e to the lambda t, they separate at an exponential rate. There was nothing about rate in the definition of sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Okay, so points in the unstable manifold exhibit sensitive dependence on initial conditions. What about an ar arbitrary point? Because remember, the, the stable and the unstable manifolds divide the plane into four regions, four invariant regions, all unbounded. Everything's unbounded that I've talked about so far, except the fixed point at the origin. If I start in any one of these regions, because we have this component of the flow, the x component and the y component, they all exhibit sensitive dependence on initial conditions. They run off to infinity trajectories, and the, the distance gets further and further apart. Is the autonomous saddle point in the plane, is that a chaotic set? No, I don't think any one, one of us would press that point. You can solve the for the its trajectories exactly, but it does exhibit sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And I've summarized the three properties that I just said here. Now let's look at another example. This is an example on the cylinder, r dot equals zero and theta dot equals r. So this can be solved exactly. r is a constant. So if we start with a given r value, it remains on a r, given r value, but theta, it's on a, it's, theta's on the circle, so it increases linearly in time at a rate that depends upon the r value. And this is the flow. So let's make an invariant set, an annulus. So we pick two radii, r1 less than r2, and we look at all r values in between, and theta on the circle. So this is an annulus. It's invariant, because if you start in it, you stay in it, You can't you, because the r component doesn't vary in time. All right, now let's take any two points. in the annulus, and let's look at the difference. The vertical lines are just any, the, the typical norms you would take. Um, and what do we see? The difference in R values doesn't change, but the difference in, if they're not the same R values, theta grows linearly in time. So trajectories do move apart, but they come back together, unlike the saddle, where they moved apart and just kept going farther and farther apart because they could be unbounded. This is not unbounded. So, but they move apart, come back, move apart, come back, move apart, come back, over and over and over. All right, example 47 is a classic example, and I don't quite have the tools for treating this. However, this is, a, this is an example on the torus. S1 cross S1, theta 1 and theta 2 are both angles. This is a classic example. Theta 1 dot is omega 1, theta 2 dot is omega 2. So they both evolve linearly in time on the torus. And the example, which I don't, didn't develop the tools for looking at, so this is the flow. And the difference between two trajectories, if I take two points on the torus, The difference between them is what? Well, the difference, they, they just 
stay the same distance apart as they evolve in time, but a given individual trajectory, if the ratio of omega-1 and omega-2 is an irrational number, it densely fills out the torus. Now what that means is that if I take a given initial condition, look at the trajectory through that initial condition, if, if the ratio of omega-1 and omega-2 is an irrational number, that will come arbitrarily close to any point on the torus. But we see that if we take two points that are close together, same is true of each trajectory, but they're going to densely fill out the torus and move around it together for all time. They're not going to move apart. Okay, now the last example. Often it's said that a chaotic system contains an infinite number of unstable periodic orbits. Okay, this is a cheap example kind of showing that that's not true. All right, r dot and theta dot are decoupled, so we can solve for r. But I want to, this, this function you've seen in calculus, as r goes to zero, it oscillates infinitely often in the limit as r goes to zero. So it has infinitely many zero crossings. Every zero crossing is an equilibrium point. Remember our discussion of the Hopf bifurcation for polar coordinates. Every equilibrium point of the r equation, plug it in here, we can solve for the theta equation. It's not going to be zero if r is non-zero gives us a periodic orbit. So in this way, we have an infinite number of periodic orbits. We can check their stability by just computing the Jacobian, and they alternate between unstable and stable. So this is an example of a two-dimensional autonomous vector field that contains an infinite number of unstable periodic orbits in a bounded region, but it doesn't have but it's not, it's not what we would call chaotic. I didn't do the analysis for sensitive dependence on initial conditions for this example, and it would be an interesting example for you to do. So, from these four examples, what have we learned? Example 45, standard saddle. We've identified invariant sets on which we have sensitive dependence on initial conditions. They're all unbounded except for the origin. We didn't have sensitive dependence on initial conditions on the stable manifold of the origin. But we're going to want boundedness to be part of our definition of chaos, chaotic invariant sets. That throws out linear systems on the plane. Okay, in 46, we had a nice little example on the cylinder, and we had sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Points moved apart linearly in time, but they came back together. But they all stayed at the same radius. Moved apart, came back together, moved apart, came back together. We wouldn't call that chaotic. 47 was interesting. It was a, it was a it was a flow on a torus. When the ratio of omega-1 and omega-2 is irrational, any trajectory will densely fill out the torus. But if we take two neighboring trajectories, they don't separate. They just evolve together for all time, not, not, not moving apart, not moving together, stay the same distance of arc, and densely filling out the source. It's torus. We wouldn't call that chaotic. And 48, we have a planar vector field with an infinite number of unstable periodic orbits in a bounded region. We're not going to call that chaotic. We didn't do anything in this co course, any examples that would truly would satisfy chaotic. But what would be the official definition for chaotic invariant set? It's going to be a combination of examples 45, the saddle, and 47 densely filling out the torus, bounded invariant set. So we want the invariant set to be bounded. 
that's something we can probably verify in a particular example. We want every trajectory to come arbitrarily close to every point in the invariant set. That's example 47. And then we want every trajectory to have sensitive dependence on initial conditions. That's not 47. It's 45, but 45 doesn't satisfy property 1 and 2. All right, so this is where, where it gets very interesting. Oh, and then I also said every trajectory, every trajectory. Probably we want to throw out every and maybe almost every, and we enter a measure theoretic setting or Gothic theory setting, but let's not get too technical at this stage. Okay, so linear systems do not behave in a chaotic way. So we need nonlinearity, and we need properties that uh, are not so easy to verify for typical nonlinear systems. And that takes you up to the next course. I hope I've whetted your appetite with this to talk about the properties that you would hope you would want to verify in a particular system that exhibits chaos. I've given you pretty plenty of examples to look at and um, references to follow up. So there are plenty of courses after this one that will be made available to you in uh, years three and four. And I hope you take advantage of them because this is an absolutely fascinating topic with many applications um, that exploit this idea of chaos. So hopefully you know that chaos is not randomness, but it's, it's imprecise knowledge of the initial condition and the properties of a nonlinear system that magnify that imprecision. Okay, I will end here. I hope you enjoyed the course. I will put a new version of the book in Figshare with lots of the little typos and punctuation. No errors, but uh, a few annoying things here and there that you can download, and hopefully you'll enjoy going through the course and learning more about this fascinating subject. Okay, bye everybody.